Okay, and so for those of you who maybe chose to opt out of the previous part, uh, so much the better, maybe, right? Uh, uh, that's a pretty heinous. So, so what are we going to do in, in this final part? And uh, are we attempting then to, to treat the untreatable? And you saw some pretty horrible examples of folks throughout the course, uh, especially when we did lecture 10, and you saw some of those, that for those of you who watched the video, um, some of those 10 portrayed in there. Uh, Harris suggests that just because existing treatments haven't been effective doesn't mean that, that new treatments can't be developed that will be effective. Now what those treatments will look like, right, uh, it's hard to know and it's hard to uh, predict their efficacy before they're even created. Uh, so the guidelines for psychopathy treatment program from Wong and Hare, and there's probably no one in the world who knows more about this than they do, so it's a great place to start. They focus on adult and adolescent psychopathic offenders. Rather than attempting to modify the personality characteristics, which we might just not be able to do, right? The proposed treatment is a strategy of self-management that helps a participant develop a pro-social lifestyle, reducing the frequency and the extent of the violent behavior. So it really is kind of an issue of damage control, right? But it, re it requires participation by the client. And uh, we can see where many people that we would consider potential clients probably don't have it in themselves to voluntarily adopt a new lifestyle. Right? So to help participants to uncover the idiosyncratic factors that cause their violent acts, if that's possible at all, right? uh, while helping them to learn specific preventative skills. So again, we're looking much more at damage control than we are necessarily rehabilitation. Um, so. Uh, further caution against the label of evil in Park Dietz, we saw a brief clip of, of the Iceman, and you can see that on YouTube in its entirety if you want, and, and see Park Dietz interview him. The interview is amazing, and I think it's well worth watching. Uh, Dietz cautions us against the label of evil, right? As far as we can tell, the cause of the behavior are biological, psychological, and social and not so far demonstrably include the work of Lucifer. So we have to get back to our, our underpinnings as social scientists, right? That, that we need to understand the biology, so stu studies of genetics and especially psychopathy are, are hugely important. Uh, psychological trauma a as it relates and the, the nature of how the mind conceives its own world and conceives the self in relation to that world. And then finally, the social. To what extent uh, do are there ramifications there? Now, Dr. Stone, and I don't know that there's a lot to support this, but Dr. Stone says that every you know high-level offender that he's interviewed has been abused as a child, either sexual or physical abuse, and has had a severe blow to the head, you know, that that kind of resulted in a concussion or more serious. Uh, and, and then these kind of facilitated the, their acts further on. Uh, is Stone correct? Is that anecdotal? What evidence is there? But you can see that the, the places to look are, are the places that we've already spent much time looking, and I don't know that we should abandon those to just invoke some kind of label of evil that, that is some kind of metaphysical quality uh, which defies definition. Right? So no Lucifer, no evil. Well, please join me then in a journey that, that poet Milton might describe as making darkness visible. And this is from Dr. Zimbardo we know from the Stanford Prison Experiment. Although it's often hard to read about evil up close and personal, we must understand its causes in order to contain and transform it through wise decisions and innovative communal actions. So really, Zimbardo's pushing it back on us as a society, and I think Robert Reber would be on board with this as well. Right? Indeed, in Zimbardo's view, there's no more urgent task that faces us today than to understand evil and find, get a grip on it. Right? Uh, and he was doubly frustrated, can, can evil be situational? And Zimbardo act as an, acted as an expert witness in the trial of the soldiers who were in fact responsible for the, what we witnessed at Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq, that is the torture and humiliation of Iraqi prisoners. Uh, so Zimbardo attempted to provide a social psychological contextual explanation that in fact this soldier is not evil, 
they participated in evil towards the Iraqi prisoners because it was an expectation, because it was socially motivated, and it was facilitated by the military at that point in time. He was not successful in defending this young man. Now you can see where Zimbardo is coming from his Stanford prison experiments, that you cast people into a role, and they behave consistently with that role. So if we cast someone into a role where evil is potential, uh, is a possible out, uh, uh, behavior of that role, then do we blame the person or do we blame the role itself? So here's his response. I was doubly frustrated and angry, first by the military's unwillingness to accept uh, many of the mitigating circumstances I detailed that directly contributed to his abusive behavior and should have reduced his harsh prison sentence. The prosecutor and judge refused to consider any idea that situational forces could influence individual behavior. In effect, they're committing, at least in Zimbardo's uh, perception, the fundamental attribution error. The, we have to look for personality characteristics as an explanation rather than situational influences. Uh, uh, theirs was a standard, uh, a standard of individualism conception that's shared by most people in our culture, and that's why, we, that's why the fundamental attribution error is the fundamental attribution error. It's the idea that the fault was entirely dispositional, all the consequences of Sergeant Chip Frederick's freely chosen rational decision to engage in the evil, that is the torture and the humiliation of the prisoners. And for us social psychologists, we want to offer situational explanations. But remember that social psychologists are not in their entirety about the power of the situation. Most of us have grown to the point where we say, look, it's a certain person in a certain situation. It's an, inter uh, an intersection, an interaction of disposition and situational forces. Now, from that, Zimbardo, in his book, The Lucifer Effect, that talked about the trial and his life's career, a fascinating work, uh, I recommend this, uh, uh, The Lucifer Effect. Right? Zimbardo advances the proposition, there's ten, uh, ten things we can do to get good people to do bad things. Uh, that, that is, ten steps towards evil, getting good people to harm others. So if you want to get a bunch of people, you want to start a cult, and you want your cult members to do evil, then this is your primer. But for most of us who want to avoid evil, then this is the way we can kind of do a gut check to see if anyone is pushing us to do evil against others. So let's look at these mechanisms done by one of the preeminent social psychologists of our time in studying this material. So Use the, use the information wisely here. Use it for good, for protective purposes, rather than for committing additional evil. One thing you can do is you can provide people with an ideology to justify beliefs for actions. So somehow we have to tell people that these actions are okay, that, that, that if we don't do this, then we may be putting ourselves at risk. Uh, this was successfully done by the by the Germans, right? That, that we have to, you know, the Jews are vermin, and so our mistreatment of the Jews is akin to mistreating rats or cockroaches, and no one whines or complains about that, right? Uh, currently, if we have caravans, right, caravans of people approaching the country that are going to do us. Uh, do us harm, right? They're out to, to kill us, to rape us, to take over our way of life. Then it justifies building walls, incarcerating people without trials for unlimited periods of time. That is, provide people with some kind of justification. Make people take a, a small uh, first step towards a harmful act with minor trivial action and then gradually increase those small actions. Hitler did this with the Jews. It was, it was very effective, right? First we just talk bad about the Jews. And then we limit the ability of, of Jews to get licensing or do business. And then we take away the Jews' businesses and we burn down the synagogues. Eventually we put them in ghettos and eventually to extermination camps. Notice, we didn't start with extermination camps. We started with relatively harmless first steps and moved people along. Those of you who are familiar with Stanley Milgram's experiment, where the teacher shocked the learner, remember that the shock, uh, the shock apparatus, the machinery, had a multitude of switches. The first shock was 15 volts. The last shock was 450 volts. So people didn't give the highest intensity shock first. They gave the lowest intensity shock and then increased it by 15 volts at a time. It's called incrementing. It's also a feature of behavioral training Right? Uh, 
subsequent approximations as used by people who supply uh, rewards for behaviors that are closer and closer and closer to the desired behavior. Right? So these things have a lot of support in our empirical studies. Make those in charge seem like a just authority that they're justified in doing this, right? And, and we have this idea of the cult of personality uh, that's, that's been bandied about quite a bit. And that is that the leader somehow is above uh, the normal human being, and thus they become a just authority in this regard. They're often, you know, talked about as, as being a highly religious or an example of a religious person. Another thing we can do is slowly transform the once compassionate leader into a dictatorial figure. And this was Hitler started off as the savior of Germany, right? His slogan was, you know, make Germany great again. And he focused tremendously on the youth, and that was one of his successful tactics. Right? And we saw the youth change because Hitler really started his work in 32, so by the time you get to 42, those nine and ten year olds he was working with then became of military age and had been fully indoctrinated to his system. So while compassionate in the beginning, he became dictatorial later on. If you provide people with vague and ever training, changing rules, then, then it creates a certain level of chaos that people can't decipher and they can't move about. So they never really know what's going on and, and right and wrong become blurry as a result because the rules are constantly changing. Some get enforced, some don't under some circumstances or towards some people. Right? So keep people off balance, so to speak. Couple more, relabel the situation's actors and their actions to legitimize the ideology that were justified in doing this. Uh, we saw during the Clinton administration that they wanted to come hard, come down hard on crime and they wanted to be identified by doing so. So they created this label for offenders called super predator, which then, right, we label these people super predators and then it legitimizes us coming down even harder for them hunting them down more ferociously and punishing them more ferociously once we capture them. Right? Provide people with social models of compliance. Uh, in Psych of Emotion we talk about what constitutes a good leader. Well the most important part of a good leader is the first follower. It's the first follower, according to Derek Stivers, that demonstrates how to follow. So we need to provide people with examples of how to follow the leader. So, and actually it's the first followers that become actually even more important than the leaders in demonstrating compliance. Allow verbal dissent. If people want to talk smack, that's fine. But they gotta keep, you know, doing the behaviors that are required. So they may complain, and that's fine to allow them to complain as long as they're following uh, the orders that they've been given. Encourage dehumanizing the victim. It's much easier to victimize non-humans than it is humans. So to the extent that we view people as different, and, and this is one of the, the most pernicious issues of white supremacy. That is, white supremacy by definition is white is superior to other ethnicities. They use the term race, which is a bogus term. Race doesn't even exist. But they believe that white people are somehow entitled to because they're superior, right? So it allows us to dehumanize, because the superior humans are the whites, everyone else then is inferior. Now, this can be played out in different uh, localities across the globe, and it's been done so for, for ages. It's a reason to enslave people. And, and remember, the ancient Greeks had slaves. Uh, we see in India now a struggle between Hindus and Muslims and attempts at dehumanizing Muslims. We see in China uh, a huge number of Muslims that are being uh, held over in western China and being brutalized in all different ways. But again, subhuman. The Japanese did this world during World War II, looking at the Koreans and the Chinese as being subhuman. So encourage dehumanizing the victim is, is one of the most important aspects of this. And finally, make exiting the situation difficult. So as you start to eliminate exits, and if you read uh, Robert Browning's book, Ordinary Men, about who was actually co uh, carrying out the pogroms during the Holocaust, especially in Poland during World War II, we see where there was a way to make it impossible for people to exit the situation. 
And notice how this relates to cognitive dissonance, because one of the ways that I experience dissonance, one of the necessary components, is that I believe that I chose the action, and I now am uh, evaluating that action negatively, which then arouses my conscience, or dissonance, if you will. Uh, if I believe that I had no choice, then it short circuits the, uh, the dissonance mechanism. Right? So that becomes a, a, a critical aspect to this. So there it is from Zimbardo, 10 ways, and notice that if we feel that our society is turning this way and legitimizing any of these actions or taking any of these behaviors, then we have to start thinking about becoming courageous and standing up for those who will be victims of this. Remember the old saying, they, they, they came for the Jews, and I wasn't Jewish, so I didn't say anything, right? And then they came for the homosexuals, and I wasn't homosexual, so I didn't say anything. And they, they came for the gypsies, and I didn't say anything because I wasn't a gypsy. Uh, and, and so it goes. And then, you know, the, 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 the line ends up then, they came for me, and there was no one left to stand up at all. Uh, so we have to determine what we're willing to allow to happen to other people on the basis of their category membership and what we're not willing to allow. And this is where the struggle to speak up, to stand up, uh, comes. Right? So as we exit here, let me leave you some evil questions. How does the label evil insulate psychologists from having to acknowledge their failures? And that is, if I can't explain a behavior, right? And because I can't explain that behavior, I'm kind of failing in my role as a scientific researcher, uh, is evil then a fair place to go? Uh, so, in understanding the offenders, it can be applied that way. And we saw it with Josh Vitti's work in trying to understand the different type of sex offenders, right? In treating the offenders, and we saw different forms of treatment, right? But to the extent that I don't understand why people offend, or I don't deliver successful treatments, then maybe evil is a really nice fallback statement to which I don't have to then take responsibility. Right? In making risk assessments when I'm wrong, well, I, I don't know how to, you know, predict evil, uh, so I, I get myself off the hook. In responding to the community, when psychologists then are called upon by the community to explain what they've observed, why it occurs, and what to do about it, if they fall short of explanation, do they just substitute the term, that's evil and we can't really understand or predict or do anything about it? So how does then, different question, how does the label evil justify the public's need to see justice done? And to what extent? can then the public classify an action as evil and move on it as such. So we've come to the end of the course and, and I know talking about evil is, is kind of a downer and probably not the best way to end, but the deal is that we have power to stand up against this, we have the power to make corrections, we have the power to observe and, and, and call it out when we see it to the extent that we feel courageous in so doing. Because when we're confronting evil, the natural response to evil is fear, right? And uh, as I'm producing a new module for Psych of Emotion, one thing we have to understand about courage is courage, by definition, is in response to fear. So while we might fear evil and, and, and look at fear uh, as something that we don't want to acknowledge, perhaps we need to acknowledge it, because fear is the first step in our pathway to behaving courageously. So to what extent are we going to do that? To what extent are we going to support each other? To what extent are we going to take care of each other? To what extent are we going to take what we've learned and move it in part to calling out and fighting evil? And at least if we can't manage that to not succumb to evil and become part of evil. I've enjoyed my time with you guys, uh, such as it's been, and uh, I wish you all the best. So concludes uh, Psych and Law for us. So you all take care, you stay healthy, and stay safe. Bye.